welcome to this third Sunday of Easter. Hear these words from Psalm 116 as we continue in worship together. I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my supplications, because he inclined his ear to me. Therefore, I will call on him as long as I live. The snares of death encompassed me. The pangs of Sheol laid hold on me. I suffered distress and anguish. But then I called on the name of the Lord. O Lord, I pray, save my life. What shall I return to the Lord for all his bounty to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. In the courts of the house of the Lord, in your midst, O Jerusalem, praise the Lord. Let's pray together. Just as the psalmist prayed, Lord God, we too will call on you for as long as we live. While there is certainly distress and anguish all about us in this season of crisis, you hear our voices and you incline your ear toward us. Today, Lord God, as we gather remotely in worship, we want to incline our hearts toward you. We want to worship you, our one true God, creator, redeemer, sustainer. Bless this time of worship to your honor and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I want to add my welcome to all of you on this third Sunday of Easter. And I want to express my thanks to uh, Jeff Wilson and Lucia Delamarter and Tom Ryan for that great opening hymn. Also thanks to uh, Greenville University intern, uh, was anyway, until uh, everything changed, uh, Brian Wells, uh, who helped to lead us in our opening scripture from the Psalms. And at the close of the service, we're going to be led through song by our other GU intern that we had for this spring, Lexi Hooper. Uh, as a part of our just our regular family life uh, time together, just want to invite you again, encourage you to share with us either online or by email or text or by phone call, any ways that we can be praying for you or someone that you know of who is in need of our prayers. We're trying to keep folks uh, updated on uh, various concerns. And in just a little bit, I'll offer a prayer of intercession for those and uh, for others as well. So uh, again, we the staff continues to meet electronically every Tuesday afternoon for prayer, and we just count it a privilege to be able to uh, share with you and help carry some of those burdens. We also want you to know that we are starting to compile our annual list of, of high school and college graduates. So uh, while we have a pretty good uh, read, on, we think, we, don't wanna, we wanna make sure we don't miss anybody. So uh, please send us any information on your graduate, whether it's high school or college or postgraduate work. Uh, make sure that, that we, we'd rather hear from three different sources the same name than to, to omit uh, somebody accidentally. So feel free to send that information in to to uh, the church office, and uh, Tina Watterson will be, will be gathering all that, and we can celebrate those graduations, even though we can't do it in person. Uh, we also, of course, are keenly aware of uh, Governor Pritzker's uh, latest mandate, actually extending the uh, shelter-in-place uh, through the end of May. Uh, let me assure you that we are taking all of that very seriously. Our conference superintendent, Ben Tolley, uh, put out a word on uh, Thursday uh, with that information and that we as churches would continue to honor those, um, uh, those, that mandate. Uh, I also want you to know that we're putting together a task force made up of some staff and some of your board to study best practices to um, just begin thinking of ways to prepare for our reopening someday. Um, let me, uh, we're also getting information from our bishops. Um, there are all kinds of webinars and articles that are out there about the best and safest ways 
to, as we think about uh, eventually reopening. But here's the thing, I, I, kind of an, uh, an image that I want you to keep in mind as we talk about this. Uh, don't think of reopening as something like flipping a switch where suddenly it was dark and now it's light, you know, that sort of thing. Instead, think about it as turning a dial. Um, this is going, there are going to be incremental moves toward reopening, and we're going to do it the safest way uh, that we possibly can. So um, just know that that is very much on our radar. Nobody wants to get together with this church family more than, more than we do. So, um, so keep that in mind, and would you pray for that uh, kind of that ad hoc uh, team that is going to be gathering best practices and uh, help us prepare. Now, uh, one other way that we can uh, be together, even while we're apart, uh, comes to us from our uh, family ministries, our early childhood and family ministries director, Lisa Barber. So I'm going to let her introduce that to you now. Good morning, everyone. My name is Lisa Barber, and I'm the director of early childhood and family ministries here at the church. A lot of you have tuned in to my story time with Miss Lisa on the Harvest Kids Facebook site and have experienced my funny hats. <laughs> this was one of the favorites. Today, I share with you my latest one. The purpose of these hats has been to bring a little laughter and hopefully a smile to others. I know everyone is ready for our shelter in place to be over and for us to go back to how it was before March 20th. There have definitely been some challenges and negative consequences to the COVID-19 crisis. And now we have the uncertainty of how long it's going to last and what the future is going to look like. But I also have heard people share that there's been some positives to our shelter in place experiences. You know God, he can always bring good from all things. One of those positives for our family has been eating dinner together every night. In fact, I feel guilty admitting this, but we've eaten together more in the last month than we have in years. We have laughed together, cried together, talked, debated, argued together, and prayed together. Hopefully, the shelter in place will be lifted soon, but I hope our dinners together will continue at home. I'm excited to tell you about a new campaign we're going to be doing. It is called Meals at Home, and we will be starting it May 1st. The goal is to challenge our church families to eat together as a family at least three times per week. We want to make meals together a priority and be intentional about having those meals together. That means turning off media during meals in order to have fun connecting with each other. We will have resources available on the church webpage and our Facebook page to help encourage you to either start or continue having meals together as a family. Studies show that when we have meals together, the health of the family multiplies. One of the simplest ways to instill strong faith and values at home is to share meals together in an, in, in an intentional manner. Our families need to not only be healthy physically, but also mentally and spiritually. Our compliance with the shelter in place and the social distancing keeps us healthy physically, but we also want to help our families to be healthy in other ways. And please don't think this is only for households that have two or more people. We not only want to encourage our individual families to have a meal together, but also our church family. Included in our new Meals at Home campaign, there will be a guide to conversation starters and ideas of things you can do together. Mealtime chat recipes, which are idea cards for activities to encourage meals together. Audio podcasts, actual recipe sharing, because the longer we are cooking at home, the more new recipes we're going to need. Virtual meals with the multitudes, FaceTime Zoom dinners with other members of our church family, and even some friendly contests and competitions. There will be all kinds of ways that you will be able to participate. We want to be creative with this, so if you have any ideas, please let me know. Please do not think by me wearing this hat, I'm taking all of this not seriously. We just realize that if we have to be at home, 
Let's use it to make and experience home growth. While we're at home, we don't want to look back and say, I wish I would have spent my time differently. Let's try to make the most out of our time at home with our families. So, starting May 1st, please check out our, our web page and Facebook page for more information. Let's celebrate having Meals at Home. Thanks, Lisa, for this new way of connecting with one another. We'll be hearing more about that throughout the week. So uh, this is just another way that we can sort of stand in that gap <laughs> where we really do miss getting together with each other. I, I would like to just invite you to join me for a few moments of intercessory prayer. Um, over the course of these last five weeks or so, of course, there have been a number of, of concerns that have uh, come up through, from within our ch immediate church family and our global church family. So I'm just going to invite you to bow with me for a few moments. As I lift up some names and some individuals and some cir circumstances, please uh, insert your own and, and add to this. So let's, let's pray. Father, how we bless you that we can come to you no matter the circumstance, no matter the challenge challenges in front of us and intercede on behalf of others, people whom we love, people that we know, people that we don't even know, but you've called us to pray for. And so uh, this, this morning, as we worship together, I want to pray specifically for some folks. I want to pray for Kay Anna Warthen. We thank you for the ways you have uh, provided for these two surgeries and now for this time of rehabilitation and healing. We pray, Lord, that uh, as she uh, continues uh, on this journey, that you will strengthen in her, that you will bring healing to her body and that you will bring encouragement to her spirit. I pray for Janet McNew as she prepares for surgery this week. Lord, you know the severity, you know, you understand all that's going on there. And we just pray that you will uh, calm her and uh, just grant her an unusual sense of your presence going into this uh, surgery. For the Forsberg family, Dan and Tammy, you know how difficult this is for for the family as Dan's mother uh, is now on hospice care and we just uh, know that they can't be with her as they would normally want to be and, and be able to be. So would you bring your comfort to the Forsberg family especially during this time. For all of our frontline workers, uh, whether it's somebody stocking shelves at a grocery store or, or uh, receiving people at the emergency room or uh, whatever the circumstance might be where these essential workers have to be on call and at the ready. We pray for courage for them and we pray for your protection for them. We pray for uh, an unusual measure of physical immunity from the virus and that you would just stand with them. For those isolated right now in care facilities, nursing homes, or hospitals, um, Lord, by your spirit, would you just come alongside with your comfort and with uh, a, a deeper awareness of your presence in those spaces. We pray for our brothers and sisters in Asia, Africa, Central and South America, in Europe. We're hearing of the dire circumstances of so many who uh, aren't just uh, isolated or, or somehow required to shelter in place. They, they don't have any idea where their next meal is coming from. Uh, uh, and, and the food uh, is, sources are drying up, uh, all, again, because of uh, this pandemic. So, Lord, uh, heighten our awareness and, and prompt us by your Spirit in ways that we can both pray and give, whether it's through our Bishop's Crisis Response Fund or in other ways. Lord, um, would you just bring your resources, your unending and abundant resources to bear, upon our brothers and sisters in other parts of the world. We pray for researchers right now who are uh, working literally around the clock to, um, to find ways to um, uh, either mitigate the, the impact of the virus or stop it altogether. For those who are seeking vaccines, increase their wisdom, Father, and accelerate the process. Uh, and may there be a breakthrough that comes uh, much sooner than what is uh, being talked about. We pray for clarity for all of us on the essentials of life and especially 
the need of a savior. I pray that you will just reach into the hearts of those who are struggling, who, who feel hopeless right now, who are angry, or who might feel smothered by stay-at-home orders that have been now been extended. Uh, or maybe I pray for those who are fearful. We just, we need you, Jesus. We need you first. We need you last and always to bring your comfort, to bring your counsel, uh, your do not be afraid truth to bear upon each and every one of us. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your presence with us in these moments. Amen. Well, friends, as, uh, as we prepare for the reading of God's word this morning, let me offer some, uh, just a few thoughts ahead of that. Over this past week, uh, we have heard an increasing number of medical experts speaking to the need for more testing and for something called contact tracing. Now, contact tracing, as one document describes it, is kind of equal parts medical work and detective work. Uh, trained staff interview people who've been diagnosed with a contagious disease, in this case, uh, coronavirus, to try to figure out where they've been recently and who they've been in contact with. And then they go and, and tell those people that they may have been exposed and encouraging them, of course, to quarantine themselves or maybe even be tested themselves to prevent the spreading of the disease any further. Well, I began thinking about contact tracing in light of the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. We are still in celebration mode as we have 50 days set aside on the church calendar to declare the risen Christ. And then, of course, another 315 days to live into that truth. Um, there was something viral happening in those days following the discovery of the empty tomb. And one of my favorite encounters in that regard had to do with two men on, uh, on the road to Emmaus, they had just left Jerusalem on the same day as that incredible discovery of the empty tomb. Chris Borwick is going to read the passage for us from Luke 24. I invite your careful and prayerful attention to the reading of God's word. Good morning. This is the lesson for the third Sunday of Easter, the book of Luke chapter 24, verses 13 through 35. Now on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And Jesus said to them, what are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still, looking sad, then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place here in these days? Jesus asked them, What things? They replied, The things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then Jesus said to them, Oh, how foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, Jesus interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. As they came near the village to which they were going, Jesus walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it is almost evening, and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and their companions, 
gathered together. They were saying, the Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. The word of the Lord. So friends, uh, think about all this, uh, what you've just heard read, in light of contact tracing. Every individual or group who encountered the risen Christ became contagious. There was a transmission of information that brought transformation with each and every meeting, whether it was, you know, like one-on-one -on -one in a garden or in a room filled with confused uh, and fearful followers or at a show-and-tell moment with one of Jesus' disciples or on a country road between Jerusalem and Emmaus. Every time one of these individuals or groups encountered the risen Christ, things went off the rails in, in a good way. No one remained the same. There was really no detective work required because every person's contact tracing led back to the very same place, the empty tomb. This encounter on the Emmaus Road wasn't so much about proving the resurrection of Christ as it was about discerning the presence of the resurrected Christ. Now think about that with me for a few moments. If I were to go out on a limb here, I would guess that many of you listening today would respond to this declaration, Christ is risen, with, he is risen indeed. Am I right? Uh, uh, we're not out to prove whether or not Christ rose from the dead. The preponderance of eyewitness accounts, the scholarly writings by faithful followers, the revelation through the Holy Spirit to our own spirits, all of that is, is more than proof enough of this supernatural occurrence, but might we be inclined to struggle a bit with the discerning part, discerning the presence of the resurrected Christ in our lives day to day? After all, I mean, nothing is normal these days, is it? Those familiar things that often sort of take us into the presence of Christ have been taken away for a season and for good reason, things like, you know, worshiping together, singing together, praying together, uh, gathering as a growth class or in a small group Bible study or with a youth group or uh, in a Harvest Kids activity or just a simple gathering over a cup of coffee. Right now, all of that is on hold. And if we're not careful, we can become lethargic or even indifferent. <laughs> we can even admit that we're really starting to like attending church on our couches in our pajamas, right? <laughs> I mean, just imagine how these two guys must have been feeling as they left Jerusalem through the Western Gate. I mean, sad, perhaps, frustrated, confused. I wonder if they kind of stopped uh, at various points along the way to kind of look back up at that city on a hill. Jerusalem, the place where the Messiah was supposed to have redeemed Israel, was supposed to have taken back the rule and reign from those, from those foreign squatters? Or, or were they longing for how things had been or seemed to have been? How would they ever get back to normal? And, and just what was normal anymore? Was it really all it was cracked up to be? Uh, how would they worship going forward? All that had been familiar, all that momentum was suddenly stopped, dead in its tracks, discerning the presence of Christ. I doubt that that was even on their radar until it was, until they were joined by someone they initially didn't recognize. Now, can I be, I want to be completely transparent with you. If I'm not careful, I can find myself on that Emmaus Road scratching my head too, wondering, what are doing? What are doing? you know, how I go forward trying to process all that has happened in recent weeks and days. Yes, Christ is risen indeed, but do I truly perceive his presence in my midst, even and especially when everything around me feels so off kilter? When those means of grace, like word and sacrament with my community, are suddenly reformatted to the extreme, and, and not just for a week or 10 days, but for weeks and weeks. I mean, it, it is true that for most persons, the context of their coming to faith is Christian worship in all its various forms, which most often includes things like, you know, scripture and proclamation and sacrament. And that's also where, where the faith of all is sustained 
to one degree or another. The Christian faith is born and nurtured where people share in worship, and that worship experience is often tactile. You know, it's through a gesture or through the waters of baptism or through the taste of the bread and the cup or through the smile or the clasp of another's hand or perhaps even an embrace. So what happens when all that's taken away? As in the case of these two men on that dirt road, the source of our worship comes to us. He meets us on the road. He meets us on our living room couches or in that hospital or on that job as an essential worker. He brings himself into our presence at the kitchen sink or on the lawnmower or while changing a diaper. Jesus is always on the move, always present, always engaging with his children. I mean, look back at the story again. It's one of movement. Verse 13, the two men are going. Verse 15, Jesus came near and went with them. Verse 28, they came near Emmaus. Also in verse 28, Jesus walked ahead of them. Verse 29, he went in to stay with them. Again at verse 31, he vanished from their sight. And then verse 33, they got up and returned to Jerusalem. Some of these movements are those of Jesus and some are of the two men. Either way, Both Jesus and his followers are on the move, but it is not movement for its own sake. The moves being made have a purpose once Jesus' presence is discerned. And and, and that purpose is to tell the story of Jesus, to interpret it, to have fellowship with Jesus and with others, and to share it with others. That's what it means to be church, whether gathered in a formal worship space or distanced from one another for a time. Here's my prayer for you today, that you will not only give witness to the resurrection of Christ from the dead, but that you will perceive the active presence of that risen Christ in your midst, no matter how messy or broken it might seem. That that he comes and to know that he comes and stands beside you, that through the gift of the Holy Spirit, God's presence is revealed and your faith can be increased. Don't let this kind of this cosmic a pause button, put a hold on your growth in faith because God is so much bigger than a virus. He desires that your faith actually increase in this season. And our triune God, creator, redeemer, sustainer, makes that possible. Now, maybe you're watching this recording at its original airtime, or maybe at a later time, and it's kind of a fluke that you just happen to to stumble upon it. And you have struggled with the idea of a savior, of Jesus, of his love, of his forgiveness. Let me assure you, he is the real deal. Jesus Christ is not only risen from the dead, but he is living and active right where you are. If if you just call out to him, He, he will not reject you. He will will not see you as a lost cause. He will welcome you with open arms. He can be your living hope, both now and for all eternity. And so in these moments, I I feel led to just offer a prayer for those of you who are really struggling to even enter into relationship with Jesus. Would you all just bow with me? Jesus, I pray just now for that one who has never chosen to follow you or maybe who has fallen away by choice or by neglect. Your word tells us that whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. That while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Thank you, Jesus, for this free gift of new life now and of life eternal. I pray pray for that one who right now is getting things right with you who is seeking this free gift of salvation, who is seeking forgiveness of sins. Bring the witness of your Holy Spirit to bear upon that person in these moments. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Friends, in just a moment, our other worship intern, Lexi Hooper, will offer our closing song called Living Hope. As as she sings, and as you maybe sing along, take note of the movement of God, of the God of the age, as the song says, toward his children. So great a mercy, 
such boundless love, such intentionality of movement beyond what anybody can really truly, truly fathom. Just as the eyes of the two men on the Emmaus Road were opened in the sacramental moment of the breaking of the bread, may the eyes of your heart be opened today to the boundless grace of Jesus who comes to you right where you are.
I pray that as you continue to go this week, um, that God grant you blessings and peace um, throughout this time. It was a blessing to worship with you all this morning. Have a great day.